Hare Krishna, Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and Maharaj. Thank you so much for joining Bhakti Sangha Japa conference call. Uh, Maharaj, whenever you have some time, you can go ahead and take over the call. And today we will be reading from 7th Canto, chapter number 1, from verse number 20. Whenever you're ready, Maharaj. Hey, Krishna, thank you. My obeisance is all of the glory. <laughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Putam Tasmin Bhagavati Duravagraya Dhamnani Pasyatam Sarvalokanam Rāyam Iyatur Anjasa Translation, how was it possible for Shishupa and Dantravarka in the presence of many exalted persons to enter very easily into the body of Krishna, whose nature is difficult to attain? Shishupa and Dantravarka were formerly Jai and Vijay, the doorkeepers of Vaikuntha. Merging into the body of Krishna was not their final destination. For some time they remained merged, and later they received the liberation of Surupya and Salopya, living on the same planet as the Lord in the same bodily form. The shastras give evidence that if one blasphemes the Supreme Lord, his punishment is to remain in hellish life for many millions of years, more than one suffers by killing many Brahmins. Shishupal, however, instead of entering hellish life, immediately and very easily received Sahuja Mukti. That such a privilege had been offered to Shishupal was not merely a story. Everyone saw it happen. There was no scarcity of evidence. How did it happen? Maharaj Yudhisthira was very much surprised. Om-gyan-timidanda-syajana-jana-salakaya-chaksu-nilu-tam-yama-tasma-shri-gurvo-namaha-sri-chaitanya-mano-dhustam-stapitam-yama-bhutale-swayam-rupa-kadam-mayam
Krishna just punched him <clears throat> and killed him. It was very quick. Both of these demons were given a benediction. They're actually great personalities who have fallen from the spiritual world, from the Vaikuntha realm. Uh, they took three births as demons. The story is that when the four Kumaris had come to the gates of Vaikuntha, they had to travel through seven gates and then finally come to the palace where the Lord was residing. They traveled easily through six gates. When they got to the second gate, these two gatekeepers, Jaya and Vijaya Stockton, the full Kumaras, they were just little children. They were four years old, but they were personification of transcendental knowledge. They were born from the body of Lord Brahma, great personalities. So they became disturbed when they were blocked by these gatekeepers to go see the Lord. And then there was some back and forth between the gatekeepers and them. And finally the Lord came and realized that the four Kumaras were offended by his gatekeepers. So the Lord gave the gatekeepers a punishment. The punishment is they had to they had to leave the spiritual world, either for three births in the material world as demons, or seven births in the material world as devotees. They chose three births as demons, and he explained that they didn't want to be separated from the spiritual world for such a long time, so they took three births in the material world as demons. But behind everything, the will of the Lord was also there. The Lord likes to fight. And sometimes we like to fight too. Our fighting usually gets us in trouble. Sometimes causes us to die or get hurt. But the Lord he is the source of everything. So the fighting spirit exists within the living entity also because we are part and parcel of Krishna. The same thing with the desire for enjoying the opposite sex. Krishna does that in the spiritual world with his parts and parcels, the gopis. But it's transcendental. It's pure. It's not material. It's not part of anything mundane and it's pure love but that same mood comes out in the material world when the conditioned soul tries to enjoy in this world with the opposite sex is based on sense gratification and some desire to fulfill one's lusty desires so these things are there the fighting spirit the second, you see that even today, one of the main movies in the world, either sex and violence or violence and sex. These two things are, are the big sellers in the world. Everyone is interested in stories centered around that. And if it's not these two, it's some cheap comedy that has no real humor in it. Um, so all of these qualities are there within the Lord, and they manifest in the material world in a perverted way. So then these two demons were destined to fight the Krishna. And as it's explained here, that to offend or attack the Supreme Personality of Godhead, it's a grievous offense. And one can suffer many millions of births in hellish life. But this didn't apply to them because they were destined to fight with the Lord. And this was the last birth of the Jai and Vijay. They were, they were commissioned to take three births. The first one was Saranyakashipu and Haranyaksha, two brothers. You read about in the third and seventh cantos. The second birth was, uh, was uh, Kubakarna, 
and uh, Ravana, Ravana and Kumbhakarni and Ram Lila. And the third was Shishupa and uh, Dantavarta and Krishna Lila. And in each time, Krishna exhibits his sporting propensity, he likes to fight. And so he can't fight in the spiritual world because they're all devotees there. So he comes to the material world to fight. And therefore, these demons play the role of his opponents and cause havoc in the world, but at the same time, the Lord is there to remove them. So for, for, for Krishna, it's a lot of fun. But, and for the demons, they actually get purified. So it's very rare that a demon can get such salokya and sarupya. Saloki means to live on the same planet with the Lord, and sarupya means to have the same bodily form as the Lord. But as it mentions here, that wasn't their final destination. After fulfilling that particular role, then they went back to the spiritual world to uh, again resume their position as Jaya and in, in the spiritual world in the Vaikuta realm. Of course, it's also mentioned that these two personalities again came in Lord Chaitanya's Leela as Jagai and Marai to again. Uh, fight with the Lord, this time Lord Nityananda. And then, of course, they got purified by Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda and became devotees. So the opportunity to associate with the Lord is emphasized here that even demons were will, willing, or even living entities willing to take the role of a demon just to associate with the Lord. Of course, uh, devotees shouldn't think that I can be inimical to the Lord and get the same benediction as them. Because uh, that would be pretense. That was planned by the Lord. Many of the activities you hear about in the Bhagavatam, such as the, uh, the unlawful uh, cursing of Maharaj Pariksit, when he apparently committed some offense to Shamagarish, his son Shringi, who was a Brahmin boy, uh, cursed him to die within seven days. Of course, when Shamagarish heard about the curse, he chastised his son, and he was very sorry to hear that, let that happen. And that was the end of the medical culture. And then uh, the, the Brahmins started to uh, engaged in activities which were considered to be unbrahminical. And then the whole caste system came in, which means anyone who's born in a Brahmin family is a Brahmin automatically. So that, that particular pastime in the, in the Bhagavatam heralded the downfall of the Brahminical caste. And then of course, it was also arranged by the Lord for Maharaj Bhrikshu to get cursed, so Sukadev Goswami could speak through my Bhagavatam for the benefit of, you, of all living entities. And we also have the example of Arjun. Arjun was on the battlefield, and he's a great devotee of the Lord. He obeys the Lord in all situ situations. He's a Shatra. He fights on religious principles. He always does his duty. But yet, he went against the will of the Lord. And that allowed for Krishna to speak to Bhagavad Gita. So many times, not many, but occasionally you'll find that there is an arrangement by the Lord to further religious principles. Just like... Um, Buddha, Lord Buddha, he came. Lord Buddha taught Gnostic that uh, there is no supreme personality of Godhead. The jiva is supreme, and the jiva should merge into the unmanifested aspect of the spiritual energy, and that is the perception. And why did he do that? He got people off the Vedas because people were using the Vedas unauthorizedly 
and setting up sacrifices to kill animals. And the animals were suffering unnecessarily. They weren't chanting the proper Vedic mantras. And therefore, they were using the Vedic mantras in order to kill animals and to eat their flesh. Buddha came to stop that, but he didn't come as a Supreme Lord. He is actually the Supreme Lord himself. And that's mentioned by Jayadeva Goswami and in his uh, uh, Das Avatar prayers. Buddha is one of the incarnations of the Lord. But he came to take people off the Vedas and bring him to the stage of atheism. So they would stop killing animals. And he taught the Eightfold Process. And of course, Sankaracharya came and brought them back on the Vedas in the monistic way. And then Ramanujacharya took it one step further. Madhvacharya brought it almost to perfection. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave the complete understanding of the relationship between the jiva and the living entity. So we have to read the books and understand why Krishna does what he does and why these pastimes are practical. Otherwise, if we don't hear or we don't read, then uh, we will get bewildered when we hear something contradictory that appears in the scriptures. Because the scriptures are contradictory, but they're not contradictory. They're in, according to time, place, and circumstances, and they have a particular meaning at a certain time. There are absolute principles and relative principles. So one has to understand what is the difference between a principle which is absolute, which is unchangeable, and a principle that applies according to time, place, and circumstance. For instance, uh, a principle that applies time, place, and circumstances, the Vedic culture in India, as, in, as people live ashram-like, generally, the ashrams are never mixed. There was not, never boys and girls or men and women in the same ashram. Usually, either there were women ashrams and men ashrams. Women ashrams were rare, but they were there. And men ashrams were the ashram. But when Prabhupada came to the United States, he changed that. And he adopted having men and women in the same ashram because he understood the culture was such that there was very close intermingling between men and women as a cultural phenomena of the Western society. And to change that, men went, maybe it was for him, he saw it would be difficult to present Krishna consciousness. So he allowed you know, women to also enter into the ashram and have equal status with men in the execution of devotional service. And Prabhupada said he became famous for all it. And so you see a great powerful acharya such as Srila Prabhupada, Shaktivesha Avatar, he adjusts his principles. But when you understand things in a, or when you read things in a broader sense, you see contradictions. Like many times Prabhupada will get criticized for certain things he says. But because you don't understand the context he's saying it in, and the explanation he gives in relationship to what he says, we take the absolute principle and forget about the relative principle which applies to a certain circumstance. So in this case, you'll see that here. And then you also see, and as you read the remaining verses in relationship to this pastime, everything becomes clear why these two demons who were Mimical toward the Lord. When Shishupal was born, Shishupal was actually the cousin of Krishna. And so Shishupal's mother was Krishna's aunt. And so they were cousins. So when Shishupal was born, his mother invited Krishna to come and see her new baby. And now Krishna understood who Shishapa was, that from the time of his birth, he was always speaking 
bad things about Krishna. Even the first words out of his mouth were blaspheming of Krishna as a little baby. But Krishna knew that and he didn't want to go on the request of his aunt to see his cousin. But she was insistent. And uh, so Krishna said, all right, I'll come. And Oh, and one thing I left out is that she took him to an astrologer when he was born. And Shushapal was born with four arms. It was a divine birth. And uh, the astrologer said that when he sees the person who will be the cause of his death, two of his arms will fall off. And so her, his mother knew that. So when she invited Krishna to come, Krishna tried to do everything to refuse her invitation, but she was insistent. So he said, all right, he came. And then when he looked into the cradle to see the, the new baby, two of his arms fell off. And his mother got shocked. He said, oh, Krishna, you were going to be the cause of the death of my son, your cousin? Krishna said, I have nothing against him, but he hates me. Therefore, I'll give him a benediction that he can blaspheme me up to 100 times continuously. And he has to take a break and then he can start again. But if he goes over 100 continuously without taking a break, then I'm going to have to respond. So when Krishna was there at the Rajasuya sacrifice and they were electing the most important personality to be honored as the personality to be honored in the sacrifice, it was Krishna. Immediately, Shishupa stood up and started to find fault with Krishna. And he started to blaspheme Krishna one after another. And Krishna was counting how many times he used words to blaspheme him. And it actually came to a point that he was he, he just kept going. He didn't stop. And Krishna was counting 97, 98, 99, 100. And then when he hit 101, and then Krishna acted and took out his Sudarshan chakra and threw it and cut off his head. And then the Sudarshan chakra dried up all of the blood so it wouldn't fall onto the sacrificial arena and, and, uh, and putrefy the whole sacrifice. When everyone, everyone saw that, and the soul of, of Shishupal immediately merged into the body of the Lord, and it was visible to everyone. Everybody saw it. So he got, you know, he got uh, so Mukti. But it was turned into Sarupya Mukti. He attained the same form as the Lord. And that will happen later on, as is explained in this series of verses. So these things are nicely explained in the Bhagavatam, how Krishna reciprocates. And anybody who meditates upon Krishna, whether it's in fear, enmity, or Love, and there is some benediction. There. Tamsa also. Tamsa was always thinking of Krishna, and when Krishna killed him, he also got liberation. The same thing happened to Harani um, Kashipu. But a devotee can't practice that mood. The devotee has to worship the Lord in love and devotion. But somehow the demons also have this merciful benediction. Of course, not all the demons, because Krishna doesn't kill all the demons directly. It's only the ones he kills personally when he comes to the material world. That's the spe special mercy that he gives to these demons. And when he killed all of those demons that were in Vrindavan. So that's Krishna's special mercy. So this chapter, the title of the chapter here is Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Ghana, is equal to everyone. 
because it says that praise and blame directed at the Lord are the same because he's not affected by either one. He is not affected by praise. He's not affected by blame. He is transcendental to everything. But when devotees offer worship to him, he accepts and he reciprocates by giving the devotee his loving mercy. The devotees have a special. So these two demons, they were actually devotees, but have fallen from their position just to take up the role to fight to Krishna, to satisfy Krishna. And each one of them, you can see, the story of Harani Kashipu will come up in the seventh canto. The story of Ravana will come up in the ninth canto, like that. And so here we are getting a little indication here of Shishupal and Dantravarka in Krishna Leela. So in any in most of the Vishnu incarnations, the Lord kills demons directly. It's when he comes as Krishna, the supreme personality of Godhead. He manifests his killing propensity in his Vishnu manifestation, and not as Krishna. In Krishna, he simply exchanges loving devotees, loving devotion to his devotees in Vrindavan, and he reciprocates their love accordingly. But when Krishna appeared in the world as the Supreme Lord 5,000 years ago, the manifestation of the Vishnu aspect of Krishna merged into Krishna's body, and both of them were there in Vrindavan. That's why when Krishna left Vrindavan, he left himself in an unmanifested form, and his Vishnu manifestation, although he's in the form of Krishna, carried with him as he went to Mathura and Dwarka is simply to kill demons. So you'll see how Krishna is so merciful. He arranges the material energy to benefit anyone who comes in contact with him. So any contact with the Supreme Lord makes one, one makes one uh, purified, at least to some degree. And the demons, these two demons, got Sahuja Muti, then ultimately Sarupya and Salokya, and they will stay on the planet with the Lord. And then they will return back to the spiritual world in their position as Jai and Vijay, the, the gatekeepers of Vaikuntha. So these are all of Krishna's wonderful pastimes with his devotees and with others. To become a devotee of Krishna means to be the most fortunate. Not very to become Krishna's devotee is the constitutional position of all living entities. But very few can actually take it up. Even when you preach to people and you encourage them and say that if you worship Krishna, you'll be happy, you'll be free from anxiety, all your desires will be filled naturally. When you die in this life, you'll go back to the spiritual world to experience eternal life and joy and full knowledge. Still, people will not worship the Lord. They're so ignorant of their position and so covered by the material energy, they can't see any benefit in it, even if you spell it out in front of them. And that is, that is the ignorance of the conditioned soul. Because condition means covered, and covered means ignorant, and ignorance means wrong activities or wrong thoughts. So the whole world is ignorant because they don't understand who they are and what is the purpose of life. And so Krishna comes in the form of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra to make it easy for them to come in contact with him. And the devotees are the merciful manifestations that spread the holy name by going to every town and village and doing kirtan, spreading the holy name, distributing transcendental knowledge, just to wake up the conditioned souls from their slumber of material uh, ignorance. So, therefore, this is the mercy of Krishna. Not only does he come himself, but he sends his devotees, and his devotees make more devotees who are also like him, who want to bring the conditioned souls 
करते हैं तो द होल पर्पस ऑफ लाइफ इज टू गो बैक टू द स्पिरिचुअल वर्ल्ड नॉट टू रिमेन इन दिस मटेरियल वर्ल्ड एंड एक्सपीरियंस लाइफ लाइफ डेथ बर्थ एंड डिजायर birth death disease and all age life after life after life which is guaranteed for those who remain distant from the lord and want to try to enjoy this material existence hari krishna thank you so much maharaj Thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. Thank you so much for all the beautiful stories, and of, for Shishupala of, of everybody that you shared today. Thank you so much, Maharaj. We hear so many times, yet we we probably forget to remember him. <laughs> you know, we think we are remembering him, him every moment, but it it always have to be an effort to remember him, and we wish it comes more naturally. But devotees, please feel free to unmute yourself and pose your questions to His Holiness. Chief Kumara has his hand up. Go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, and out Brahms Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, one question uh, with respect to uh, carrying uh, Krishna Bhakti Maharaj. if our uh, endeavor or efforts in sharing krishna bhakti uh, with the circle that we know of if it is not taking any effect maharaj uh, does it necessarily reflect the purity of the sadaka that uh, the others who are being preached or shared are not uh, willing to take up bhakti not necessarily mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've preached to a lot of people, and still mm. they don't pick it up. <laughs> um, and when the wood is dry, it catches fire. But if the wood is wet, mm. it won't catch fire. So, if people continue to hear, then gradually they'll start to become more and more receptive. Hmm. So it's a process. That's why it's mentioned that shravanam mm. should go on continuously. Mm. So preaching goes on, and many times we continue to emphasize, and people come. And so everyone is an individual. Everyone is at a certain level of uh, life, life's position according to their karma. Mm-hmm. and some people are able to be receptive and understand others mm. can never understand it depends how simple they are so basically it says the more people are somewhat pious and have mm. performed pious activities they are more receptive to the message of, of spiritual life krishna conscious whereas those who are impious mm. um see any value in it or even even though they might hear it so people are on different levels mm. of course the more pure the speaker is the more potency he has in delivering the message mm. Mm. and that is there also mm. so for for even for some people who are really covered when they come in contact with a pure devotee they somehow or other are able to benefit simply by that pure devotees association mm. Mm. so the pure devotees are like the sun they break they break the darkness by their appearance by their words okay. so yeah so purity is the force that's one of mm. the statements that are mentioned in the shastra mm. but receptivity is the also a factor of people's taking or not taking mm. Okay. Okay. So it's a combination. Hmm. Okay. Wonderful Thank question you. and wonderful answer. 
Thank you. Um, we have Jyoti Mataji. She was asking, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Tandavat Pranam. When a follower of Krishna, when a follower of Krishna conscious will be able to realize that name of the Lord and he himself is the one. Is all the practice practices should lead to this realization? Yeah. When one of the first stages of bhakti in the process of chanting is to come to the realization that Krishna's name is non-different than Krishna. That is the first stage of purification. And then that leads to understanding that Krishna's forms are also non-different than him. Krishna's qualities are also non-different than him. And Krishna's pastimes are also on the absolute platform also. Well, the first is the name. Uh, so we have to purify ourselves. We have to chant the name with attention, with devotion, following the principles as given by the spiritual master, and chant with a desire to please the Lord, to offer our bhakti to the Lord. For the process of chanting is what it is. It's a process that awakens our realization of the Lord. And one of the stages of that realization is to understand Krishna's name was not different. And that is an experience. It's not a theoretical concept that one simply adopts. It's a couple of Theory is a way to understand, but realization is a way to experience. So if we can continue to practice, follow the principles, and uh, work under the guidance of the spiritual teachers, and then gradually we'll, we'll be able to free ourselves from the offenses of chanting and come to the stage of, of uh, chanting without offense. And then we can start getting a taste for the chanting of the Holy Name. And that taste is an indication of Krishna, a sweet taste that comes. Maharaj, one follow-up question with regards to this. So Prabhupada has said that when we are chanting, we can actually just focus on the hearing of the sound, the vibration of the sound. And however, when we do that for for a few seconds, it is there, but then the mind might visualize something, imagine something. I mean, can we, and I know Prabhupada had said that you don't even need to forcefully visualize Krishna's Tribhanga form. But uh, if I don't forcefully visualize, then something other, some other image might come. Any thoughts on that? Well, if you're chanting properly, as it says in the Shastra, Krishna's, Krishna's, you focused on the sound vibration. And if any other thoughts come in your mind, you just you just go back to listening to the sound. Yeah. Dismiss those thoughts. That's yes. Um, yeah. And that's why we, we should go to the temple. We should, or have our deities at home. You take darshan of the deities, keep the deities image in your mind. And then when you're chanting, those, then those images will again appear in the mind when the chanting is done nice and, and properly. It's not even a high stage of bhakti to have the deities vision come into your mind. It's just that the mind is actually a little bit peaceful. And now uh, Krishna is appearing as he was seen by you in his deity form either in the temple, in a picture, anywhere. Very beautiful. Thank you. Maharaji, one question on the chat, I think it's from Jyoti Mataji. She says, respected Maharaji, how to define marginal energy in devotion? Marginal energy? In devotion. And she's, I think she's asking, how do we understand marginal energy? as a devotee. Well, I'm trying to understand what she means by marginal energy. There is, marginal energy is, we are marginal. The living entity in the material world is marginal. 
no guru uh, no maharaj ji i was i uh, hari krishna that was pranam to you i was saying there is an interior energy inferior energy and the superior energy right so uh, the, uh, the uh, consciousness that uh, we have it falls under a marginal energy that that is what i read so i the question was regarding yeah. that yeah marginal energy is us in the material world we are spirit but we're covered by matter so material energy is there and spiritual energy are together in the living entities existing in the material world our body is material we are spiritual that's marginal there is the pure spiritual energy and then there is the material energies so when those two energies come together that is a living entity in the material world that's marginal that's you <laughs> yes maharaj ji so after a certain point the mercy is is the blessing right uh, we can do our endeavors to an limit uh, we can just try try every day we have to try but there will be the mercy which will take over or the blessings that will that will take over the devotion right if we could able to hopefully if we could able to please krishna then only we can we could realize because the name and the holy name uh, that goal is very very far away from the practice that we are doing because i am conditioned right now so is my understanding correct maharaj ji yeah what it means is actually you're starting to realize you're not this body which is the material energy you know you're understanding yourself as being different than the body which is you the spiritual being so that means you're 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 developing the knowledge based on your practice of krishna consciousness and that's the mercy the mercy comes in the form of realizing yourself different than matter matter is everywhere but we are spirit within the matter but to realize yourself different requires to chant to read and to uh, please the lord and by pleasing the lord he gives transcendental knowledge and the first principle of transcendental knowledge is like the bhagavad gita what is the first thing that krishna taught well, you're not this body the whole second chapter of the bhagavad gita is well not the whole but the first uh, from verse number 11 to verse number 30 krishna very detailedly and different from different angles of vision explains the difference between the soul and the body between you and your body between what is material and what is spiritual so that that realization is the preliminary realization that is required in order to actually come to the stage of krishna consciousness and until you come to that level of realization you have to at least understand i'm not this body it's not me what happens to the body is not happening to me i'm in the body the car crashes but the driver is different than the car so we are the driver of this body under the influence of krishna who sits within the body as a super soul two souls within every body you and the lord both are spiritual both are free from matter both are unaffected by matter but because we identify with the mind which is a condition thing we think that we are this body and we think that what happens to the body happens to me that's illusion what happens to the body doesn't happen to you although you think so that's called material consciousness or maya illusion Well so the first principle of get waking up is to understand hey I'm not the father then who am I I'm Jiva Sarupai Krishna and Nitya so I'm eternal servant of the supreme lord but here I am in the material world Thank you Maharaj and what happens to the mind is also not a uh i i i the take away from your 
explanation is the cultivation and you mentioned about we need to experience the realizations that is that is what i i take away thank you so much for the explanation hari krishna hari krishna thank you so maharaj the actual challenge is to cleanse the mind right because what happens in in the mind is also not us so we are we yeah. understand it's not the body but also not the mind yeah, yeah. the first verse in shikshastra is chaito darpanam marjan to cleanse the mirror of the mind purify the mind make the mind reflect the position of the soul's existence when the mind is purified it's like it reflects the soul's existence when it's covered by material desires material activities then it identifies with these things and it covers the soul's existence the first principle is to understand i am not matter pure spirit thank you maharaj darshini mata ji would you like to go ahead and ask your question thank you mata ji hari krishna maharaj tanvat pranam sol ke aur shishi ka prabhupad maharaj my question is that of how do we overcome inattentive chanting because you know we start off with uh, listening to it properly listening to the sound vibrations properly but as the mind takes you somewhere else even the sense of hearing is also taken away somewhere else and by the time i realize that my mind has gone somewhere else some names have gone already during chanting so any uh, suggestions you would like to give me on that please you're welcome to the club everyone has the same problem you're not alone some degree or more it's just the way it is chanchala hi manat krishna samiti balavad vidha chaitya hum ne janam mai vayur dam duska the mind is flickering wandering restless turbulent unsteady that's what arjun told krishna and krishna said you're right but he said if you practice and you detach yourself from sense gratification So if you're practicing Krishna consciousness but you're still trying to fulfill your material desires you're not going to be able to control your mind. You have to stop trying to fulfill your material desires and then practice Krishna. As long as we're still in contact with the material energy trying to extract something from material activities we won't be able to control the mind at any time. The mind will always go in that direction. because we're custom to do that by our association with matter from a life after life so krishna says abhyase hatu kunta ya vairagyane chitriha practice he said practice performing the activities of devotional service give up the desire to enjoy this material world even though that desire may still be there don't act on it don't try to fulfill your material desires just try to satisfy krishna engage in activities that are of a that are of devotion maintaining the body is not material desires it's something that is required but when we live in a world and we're trying to get happiness from our material activities that is material desire whatever it may be We're not looking for happiness from the material energy because it can't give us any happiness. Because we're contrary to that existence. We are spirit and that my material energy is matter. So live in the world in such a way as you see everything in relationship to Krishna and try to use whatever you have in the service of the Lord. That is bhakti. Otherwise, the mind will always go. in the material which is the way it is and of course we use our intelligence to bring it back but it continues so if you practice then after some time you'll be able to chant nicely and stay fixed in your chanting 
but stop trying to enjoy this world. But Maharaj, I have a follow-up question on that. I mean, um, so when, for example, a, a woman gives birth to a child, she becomes so happy, or whenever they are some somebody's accomplishing something, they become happy. Why is it not good to be happy? Wouldn't it cause depression? No, it's not right to be happy. This is natural. You know, yeah. you share, that's all right. That's that's happening. But that's not a material desire. Material okay. desire is when you're trying to enjoy something and you're making making an effort to enjoy it. Like, you know, all right. Uh the kirtan is on tonight at the temple. The devotees invited me to come, but there's a nice movie on tonight. And I haven't oh. seen the movie. It's only going to be played once. It's a day. It's uh, you know, it's been played before. Now it's coming and making a comeback for one night premiere. I got to go see that movie. Or my relatives say, "Oh, you know, it's the family reunion, and you have to come because you're a member of the family." And your cousin is getting married, and, and at the same time, there's a retreat at GEV, and Swami G is asking everyone to come. And you think, oh, yeah, you know, retreats are always there, but this marriage only happens once in a while. <laughs> then you go there, and then they eat meat and drink wine. You think, why that? What the heck am I doing here? <laughs> So, yeah, so in other words, when you make an effort to find happiness by material activities, right. if you're a father, mother, and you have a baby, and the baby is night and born, that's the source of happiness. That's not material. Okay. That's just natural. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for all your answers. Um, I don't see the name of the person, SB, it's written. You have raised your hand. Please unmute yourself. I know. His name is Rishab. Oh, okay, yeah. Rishab. Go ahead. Hare Krishna. Dear Guru Maharaj, we have a couple of basic questions of Rapa. Do you hear me? Yeah, we can even see you. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Maharaj, you mentioned one thing about the uh, Kaushala Prabhupada made this revolution of putting a woman and man in the same ashram uh, so that he can give uh, the opportunity uh, to Western-minded people to act, uh, to practice Krishna consciousness. So my question is actually, following the Vedic principles helps our mind to become and helps us to kind of discipline ourselves, uh, to be more austere so we can practice the Krishna consciousness in calm state of mind. So if we are practicing Krishna consciousness now in the West, where there is uh, ashram of men and women in the same place, is it much more austere to practice Krishna consciousness and be fixed in Krishna consciousness than if it's only one ashram? Uh, this is done for the sake of preaching. And Prabhupada said, when devotees complained about that adjustment, Prabhupada said, you know, you just take, you just take shelter of the holy name and the holy name will protect you from getting uh, victimized by the association of the opposite self. And generally in the ashram, you don't mix anyway. The ashrams are set up in such a way as that the ladies live on one level, the men live in another area. So there's a separation within there. They come together only during the functions. And of course, sometimes they interact during particular services. So Prabhupada took a risk, but he knew that without making this risk, it would be probably impossible to preach the Krishna consciousness because of the cultural uh, characteristics of the Western, that the natural mixing of men and women is there. So you might say it is a, it's a, for some it's an austerity for others it makes life easier depends on who you are 
Yes, thank you. I think it's a really valuable point to to make people aware how uh, how to how to be aware of these principles that we are trying to follow. It we are not together about neglecting it. Many times they are like you know, oh you know, just forget it. Who cares? And they even uh, uh, you know just kind of forget this principle. But also also like they're already transcendental. And then many complications come from that in the pra end. Prabhupada gave us, and Prabhupada also taught us an etiquette in reference to dialogue. He said, men should refer to women as mother. And that puts that, that sound, not to call a woman mother, at least in the Vedic culture, is an honorific way to address a lady. And women are in that mood. They're also using women become mothers at one point in their life. So um, in order to, it doesn't gravitate down to an ordinary relationship. When you address a lady, you call her, you know, Mataji or mother. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Sri Devi Mataji. Please go ahead. As you were speaking, Guru Maharaj, my humble obeisances to you and all the Vaishnavas, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, I was remembering, you know, exactly what you said, that the brahmacharis were complaining, oh, these Matajis, it's not good for us to be with them, it's so agitating. So Prabhupada said, women are everywhere. If you're so agitated, then go to the forest. Thank you, Mataji, for sharing. Shiv Kumar Prabhuji had a one last question. He was saying, um, when there is uncertainty in material circumstances or aspects in the life of a devotee, is that for testing the faith or developing the faith or both? When there is adversities? Yes. Adversities? For one who's fixed in Krishna consciousness, is opportunities for advancement. For one who is a neophyte, uh, a new, or you might say a, a, a third class devotee, they will see these adversities as being uh, reverses or obstacles. For one who's fixed, they can see Krishna and everything and everything in Krishna and learn how to use an adversity to turn it into something beneficial. And Prabhupada writes about that, that great souls, they see adversities as the hand of the Lord in order to bring them closer to the Lord in devotion. But for devotees who have very little knowledge or on the lowest level of bhakti, and they, they don't see it like that. They see it as, as obstacles. Thank you, Maharaj, for sharing. We have one quick question from Karpa, from Dr. Karpa Vagavali. And um, doctor is saying, kindly instruct us how to overcome when people criticize us. How to? What did you say, Maharaj? We missed you. How to overcome and people criticize? Yeah, pe people's criticism. Yeah. Well, and there's a variety of ways to react. Depends on the person. Depends on the situation. Depends on what was being said. I can't give a definite answer, but one of the things is to learn how to tolerate and uh, somehow move on. That's a general answer. It doesn't apply to all situations. Uh, or if someone criticizes, you can see if there's some, some value in their criticizing and see if you can benefit from what they say. Yeah, our false ego gets dented every time before we get some criticism. But 
Krishna is allowing it to happen for some reason to help us to learn something, to move forward. Something. Uh, we can tell the doctor to uh, read Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, 17th chapter, verse number 20. I think it's verse number 16, seven, verse 16, 17. Read, read those verses and the purports. And because it's, it's quite an extensive discussion and there's a lot of detail in there. Well, no one can see actually why things are happening the way they're happening. There's more to that. So there's more to it than what was on the surface. But criticism also can be beneficial, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it is. But go into that series of verses. It's a read. It's a chance to really dive into Bible time in a, a very uh, complete way. First Canto 17th chapter, verse number, I think 17, 16, going all the way on to at least verse number 25. Nice purports discussion. It's amazing. But all I can say is that sometimes you have to tolerate, sometimes you have to react by responding, sometimes you have to go away. Sometimes you have to, you know, there's different ways to, to respond to the criticism. But, but, but the healthiest way is to listen to what it's being said and see if there's some, some benefit in what they say. Right, Maharaj, we all have room for improvement. It's only good. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all your questions and all the devotees, sorry, all devotees' questions and all Maharaja's answers. Any last minute questions, devotees? Do not hesitate to switch on your cameras so Maharaj can bless you by looking at you. It's not possible. <laughs> for Maharaj, it's always possible. Please make it happen. We desperately are seeking your blessings, Maharaj. The fallen soul, please do bless us. Indu Lekha Mataji, do you want to go ahead with your question, Mata? Mataji, you're muted, I think. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandwa Pranam to you. Um, my question is, uh, Supposing somebody has done something like really bad to you, to me, and uh, like I've accepted it, it's the hand of Krishna and uh, want to move on. But still, like even while chanting, like feelings of anger and resentment towards that individual karma. So how do I <laughs> get over that? That like, even though, I've accepted everything that's happening. Um, that how to get over that feeling of anger and resentment towards that individual? Well, that's the same answer I gave to the previous questionnaire about that section in the Bhagavatam. But Prabhupada no. would, but what Prabhupada would say, do not become disturbed by the instrument of your karma. So someone is delivering something to you. That person may be just a messenger of what you need to hear. And so it may not be if you blame that person, then you're not seeing the whole picture. And you're also implicated in the activity by blaming that person also. That's mentioned in that section, which I explained in the Bhagavatam, 17th chapter there. 
Okay. So somehow or other, something has come that's very unpleasant, but You know, we get criticized maybe unfairly or appears to be unfairly. Sometimes something has happened in the past that we did that we forgot about and we're getting the reactions in the form of the present situation. That's why the intricacies of karma are so difficult to understand, especially interpersonal exchanges. So learn the devotee has to learn to be tolerant, that's all, and thoughtful. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. And then also forgiving. As soon as you forgive that person, then you're no longer disturbed by that anymore. You may not forget the situation, but at least if we practice forgiveness, we can move on in our life. Because people make mistakes, people do wrong things to us, we do wrong things to other people, we expect to be forgiven too. True. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Uh, well, thank you, Indulekha. Beautiful name, Indulekha Prema Mai. Wow, beautiful. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for your mercy. Any other last minute questions for His Holiness? Amy Mataji, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanwat Pranam. I just have a follow-up question to what was just being discussed about uh, uh, forgiving and uh, tolerating. So, I mean, this comes up, especially at workplace uh, frequently, like uh, you tolerate, you forgive, but the person uh, to whom the interaction is going on, do we have to still be friends or we can just have a working relationship uh, was is that acceptable that is equal to forgiveness or we have to become friends and not necessarily become friends because sometimes you we also say forgive but don't forget because you don't want to fall into that same situation again so you, you may not be able to come close Because it might happen again. Thank you, Maharaj. Done for now. Yeah. That's up to you if you want to go that direction or not. But, but if that person had if that person has offended you and hasn't apologized and it becomes obvious it was offense, then you want to avoid that. Thank you, Maharaj, for your answer. Maharaj, where are you now? Uh, I'm in uh, Mumbai in, in India. Are you, when are you coming, planning to come back here in Chicago? Sorry. That's so far. <laughs> oh my God. I'll be back. What? I just went to the United States uh, in July. Oh, in July. I was in the United States from April to July. And now I'm in India till February, to mid January. And I'll be in Europe for March, April, May. And I'll probably come back to US around June, somewhere around there. Okay. If Krishna lets me, they, these are long range plans are always subject to change. Scarlett Mataji, please go ahead with your question. Hi, Krishna, and thank you very much for today's class. May I please ask where in Europe you are going to be? I can't, I couldn't hear what you said. 
May I please humbly ask where in Europe you are going to be? I, I can't really say. It's, all I know is that I'll be in Italy at the end of April. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't really want to discuss something that may change anyway. I'll let my, make my schedule known in due course of time. Right now, it's too it's too early to make any schedule. Thank you, Shamaraj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Bhagwan. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Very very wonderful class. Very nice answers you gave and. Uh, thank you so much for your wonderful association, Maharaj. Every alternate week, we have very nice, beautiful Thursday. Thank you so much. Hi, Krishna. Thank you. Okay, so I think we need to move on. Thank you very much. And we'll see you again very soon, a couple of weeks. On Chakal Patero Bhashik, Rifas and Jay,